afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a member's business debate on motion number 13845 in the name of Christina McKelvey on Halt Welfare Reform. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Christina McKelvey to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I take this opportunity in opening the debate to thank all of my colleagues across the Chamber who signed this member's motion to allow it to be debated today. Can I also uh, pay tribute to the work of and say thank you to HIV Scotland and NAT, Sam H and the Disability Benefits Consortium and Pat Onions, who is the, um, uh, the inspiration behind this motion. Presiding officer, last week my colleague in Westminster, Angus Robertson, asked the Prime Minister about the suicide of Mr Michael O'Sullivan, a 60-year-old disabled man and father of two. His death followed his work capability assessment. Mr Robertson asked the Prime Minister to publish some 60 investigations by the Department of Work and Pensions, which could expose many more tragic cases of this kind. So far, he has refused to do so. Meanwhile, the coroner has warned that there is a risk of further deaths. We must keep sight of the fact that welfare reform is costing lives, bringing misery and debt into families, and all in the name of putting the UK into surplus. Even his own backbenchers are questioning the Prime Minister's approach, although the Chancellor himself has suddenly decided that the House of Lords is profoundly undemocratic. That's what you say when the vote isn't in your favour. Even if the notables in the geriatrics and the Tory donors are rejecting Mr Osborne's plan and calling for a rethink. Last week, Tory MP in our maiden speech, the Tory MP for South Cambridgeshire in our maiden speech, Heidi Allen, has suggested that ministers were losing sight of the difficulties of working people and their single-minded determination to achieve a surplus. Reform is not a spreadsheet, she said, and she fears the way her government is going about the whole process is all wrong. And Conservative Johnny Mercer urged the Chancellor to do, and I quote, something, anything, unquote, to, he to ease the harshest, as he put it, effects of the cuts in vulnerable people. He also said, my duty, and indeed our duty, is to shout for the most vulnerable. And on Sunday, we were told that three Cabinet members, unnamed, have expressed their concerns about George Osborne's planned cuts to working tax credits. And we can see the mess that that has created this week. Ruth Davidson, too has also expressed her anxieties. She has said, we can't have people suffering on the way. The government needs to look at this again. When you have this kind of rebellion in the governing party at Westminster, you most certainly do need to look again at your proposals. Presiding officer, this SNP government is shouting out for the most vulnerable, but Westminster isn't listening. And even going by for uh, Prime Minister's questions today, they're still not listening. There can be no trade-off between people's lives and national debt? Are we all going to sit us around and say, oh well, collateral damage, a term that I abhor? Are people uh, who happen to have a disability, whether mental or physical, or who struggle to find employment that they can manage, that, that they can manage, are to be punished? Are those folk who have been forced into debt and down to the food bank meant to feel that they are the undeserving poor? Honestly, presiding officer, does anyone actually want these so-called welfare reforms? We hear all sorts of dodgy claims by the Westminster government that cutting benefits is the only way forward. After yesterday's welfare reform committee, presiding officer, I remain completely unconvinced. I don't claim to be an economist, but I do understand that the more money a national government pulls out of an economy, the less there is available for people to spend. That being so, then how can you grow and develop your economy. And I'm sure I will be accused of oversimplification, but it seems abundantly clear to me that if you pull money away from people, you take it out of the local spending, so people have less to spend, and the Treasury then receives less tax. More brutally and more honestly, this government is literally taking bread out of the mouths of babes. The most disadvantaged, those with the already added strain of long-term health problems, and those whose quality of life is already compromised. In my constituency in Hamilton, Larkhall and Stonehouse, 3,400 families in work with 5,800 children are going to feel the loss of tax credits where it hurts most on the lives and well-being of their children. So much for making work pay. 
Here are families desperately struggling to make end meets, often in low-paid jobs or on zero-hour contracts, and they are being told that the government sees fit to take more money out of their pockets to the tune of around £1,000 a year on average. For many family, the families, the figure is twice that. The people who suffer most are the least able to get heard. The bankers, public school politicians and the affluent aristocracy are already and regularly given a voice. Those at the bottom of the pecking order get little but abuse. Pat Onions is a constituent of Lanarkshire. Her ceasefire campaign calls for an emergency halt to sanctions, timing out and the distress and repeated um, assessments for sick and disabled people. The evidence shows that despite the government's claims, sick and disabled people in the work-related group activity are not finding employment. So what is the government's reaction? Is it to punish them some more? to harass them and blame them for the predicament they find themselves in. They are attacked as benefit scroungers, lazy or not, or being too picky. Work done to make reasonable adjustments to the workplace for those with disabilities is a great achievement, but it isn't enough. Some people have conditions that mean that the, the, the reasonable adjustments, they cannot compete as effectively as fit people in the ruthless, competitive, open job market. We need to discuss the extra cost more, more major changes will bring to an employer. Bet no one discusses sheltered working arrangements, quotas or subsidies to help. I have already met with many constituents who are suffering a major drop in their income under the, the changes to DLA. Many have lost that benefit and others will find it extremely difficult to attain PIP. Because of the UK Government's 2010 decision to reduce the DLA budget by 20%, very few of these people will actually get PIP. So if PIP is not halted, these people will lose all their vital support. It makes no sense to implement that change the Scottish Government is repeatedly on the record as having opposed. Fixing the damage, costing as much as would, fixing the damage would cost as much in health and social care, cost terms, than the rollout would. In Hamilton, Latcall and Stonehouse, there are 840 people of working age who receive the low rate of DLA and do not, will not qualify for PIP. The impact on these individuals, their carers, who will no longer qualify for carers' allowance either. Their families and communities could be catastrophic. We have our parliament with its limited powers, presiding officer, but we have Westminster and we have the issue that they just don't seem to listen. So the introduction of evil diminishes our power massively. It turns our MPs into second-class elected reps and smacks very much of a revenge attack. It is, however, just one example of the means by which Westminster will continue to determine, determine our future in Scotland. That is something we must counter for the sake of all of those silenced voices suffering the cruelty of Conservative policy, even though that government has had only one MP in Scotland. And he isn't in Hamilton, Latcall or Stonehouse. So, presiding officer, along with Pat Onions and all of the others, I say call a halt and call a halt now. Thank you very much. We now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes or so, and I call Neil Finlay to be followed by David Torrance. <coughs> President officer, I hate the term welfare uh, when it's used in the context that it's being used uh, here today. One dictionary definition of welfare is the good fortune, health, happiness and prosperity of a person, group or organisation. Well, none of those descriptions are fitting for what people in benefits are experiencing at present. So I prefer the term social security, defined as a government programme that provides economic assistance to persons faced with unemployment, disability or agedness. And it's social security that's been at the heart of our welfare state, a, a series of policies that have since its creation helped civilise our society with the principle of a safety net through which no one would fall. Well, that safety net is now full of large gaping holes. And that's the inevitable consequence and deliberate consequence of an adherence to neoliberal economics and doctrine, where progressive taxes on wealth have shrunk as regressive taxes have increased, with the poor now paying 47% of their income in tax, whilst the rich pay 35% where wages at the top have fallen whilst the wealth of those at the, uh, wages at the bottom have fallen whilst the wealth of those at the top has soared. Pensions have been cut. Payday loan use spiralled. Food banks have become 
an almost accepted part of our culture. What a damning indictment that is. And while, all the while, corporate welfare, through bank bailouts, tax cuts, tax allowances, quantitative easing, EU subsidies, privatisation and tax avoidance dishes out eye-watering sums of money to the biggest and more, most profitable corporations. And who is it that's paying the price of the global banking crash? Is it the investment bankers? Is it the hedge fund managers, the gamblers in the city? Of course it's not. It's the people who always pay. It's the people on low pay. It's the people in insecure jobs and the people who rely on our social security system. And it's the same here as it is in Ireland, as it is in Spain, as it is in Greece, in the US and elsewhere. But of course, aren't the Tory party relishing ripping apart that safety net, claiming that they have to do this to balance the books? So they pay the likes of Atos, NGS, Working Links and other agencies billions through the failing work programme or via the brutal work capability assessments. And they implement a sanctions regime that is regularly cruel and often absurd. And they've created a horrendous and horrible culture around the benefits system, which is humiliating and degrading for claimants and miserable and demoralising for the staff who work there, as we heard yesterday at the Welfare Reform Committee. And things are just simply going to get worse. Christina McKelvey has referred to the shambles over tax credits. But we've also got the rollout of universal credit. With, without doubt, the worst and most ill-judged decision of them all, and that is the payment of housing benefit to landlords, eh, to tenants rather than landlords. Eh, as a former housing officer, I can think of no worse policy that they could have come up with. It's as if they've sat around a table and said, right, let's come up with a plan to see how we can get the most people evicted possible. Thankfully, we will be able to do something different in Scotland. And then we see the move to personal independent payment, which is designed to take billions and, sorry, millions of pounds worth of benefits, disability benefits from disabled people. Now, I think no one would disagree with the view that social, the social security system needs reform. It's complex, it's bureaucratic, and it's at times indecipherable. But it needs reform to make it simpler, fairer, more humane, and a service that helps people and doesn't humiliate people. President officer, any of us could experience periods of unemployment. Any of us could experience mental health or a disability. I'm sure none of us would want to go through a system that we see at the moment. Thank you very much. I now call David Torrens, who will be followed by Alec Johnston. Thank you, President Officer. I'd also like to thank Christine McKelvey for bringing this important motion to Parliament today. Living in such a prosperous country, I'm concerned that we are confronted with more cuts to welfare benefits. However, I welcome this opportunity in the Chamber to highlight the devastating impacts austerity has on our communities, whether it is families, adults or children. Today, I join Christine McKelvey in rejecting the austerity agenda set up by the Westminster Government. This agenda taps into people in and work poverty by targeting the most vulnerable members of our society. New statistics indicate that welfare reforms will push more than 6 million people in and work poverty across the UK. In terms of specific entitlements, 105,000 disabled people in Scotland are in danger of losing their benefits, while tax credit reforms are predicted to reduce the income of up to 280,000 Scottish families. Overall, austerity measures are predicted to cost Scotland's economy £1.5 billion annually. An OECD study has further demonstrated that growing inequalities caused by benefit cuts are a severe obstacle to economic growth. With these numbers in mind, I believe that we also have to acknowledge the multifaceted effects of welfare cuts are, beside the deepening social inequality, the UK government austerity plans shows little respect and dignity for those affected. Counteracting the Westminster's direction, the Scottish Government is strongly opposed to austerity and has taken its own initiatives in reducing the worst effects of austerity on individuals. In fact, reducing inequality and creating a fairer society lie at the heart of its policies. The Scottish Government's efforts include fully mitigating the bedroom tax in Scotland, enabling additional support through the Scottish Welfare Fund and Community Care Grants, and establishing the Scottish Independent Living Fund to help more than 2,800 dis disabled people across Scotland. 
I welcome these met endeavours and easing the burden of people who are less fortunate. However, welfare cuts are not just, just about numbers, statistics and political bargain. Welfare cuts are real people, including many unemployed, disabled people and young people. Nothing will affect us better than a sharp increase usage of food bank banks across Scotland. The Trussell Trust has reported 1,117,689 people visiting Scottish food banks between 2014-15. Between 2012-13 and 2013-14, the organisation noted a 398% increase. When Trussell Trust launched an inquiry among food bank users, one of the most common reasons for accessing the service was a reduction in their welfare entitlements. Besides talking about these national trends, I want to use this opportunity today to mention some of the examples in my Kirkcaldy constituency. Kirkcaldy Food Bank was launched in 2013. It works as an independent community-based organisation. It relies on donations and help of volunteers. Nothing less, it's committed to support local residents is invaluable. Over a period of 12 months, starting in December 2013, it prepared emergency food packages for 4,685 individuals. This past September, it prepared 240 food parcels that served 3,870 meals. Growing demand shows how essential these services are. Thus, I want to commend all voluntary staff members for the Kirkcaldy Food Bank who invest much of their time and effort into ensuring both adults and children do not have to go to bed hungry at night. As we are facing further tax cut credit cuts, more people are under a risk of falling beneath the poverty line. Especially low-income families with children are most likely to suffer. In Kirkcaldy, approximately one in five children grow up in poverty. Cognizant to this, we have to be alert that this number can rise further. Giving each child the best possible start in life is truly important in creating a fair and equal society. However, I am concerned that a growing up in poverty will cause many obstacles to this goal. In addition to increasing the number of families and children affected by austerity, the way welfare cuts are being implemented is problematic. An example highlighting some of the discrimination practices used against welfare seekers was brought to me by one of my constituents. He was sanctioned for six weeks as he has missed one day of his triage course, even though I informed him he would not be there due to his father's funeral. Before I conclude, allow me to make one more important point. As, a, as an economically developed country, we carry a social responsibility to our citizens. A responsibility to treat all individuals with dignity and respect. A responsibility to support those unable to work. A responsibility to provide families with a basic income that does not make them rely on food banks. Presiding officer, austerity impedes us from taking up this responsibility. Therefore, I support this motion to halt welfare reform. Many thanks. I now call Alec Johnston to be followed by George Adam. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is traditional in these debates to congratulate members for having been able to bring forward a subject for debate. And I would like to do that and go a stage further today uh, and pay tribute to Christina McKelvey for the persistence with which she has brought this issue before this Parliament. It is important that we address it and address it regularly, uh, and her work, particularly in members' debates, uh, is worthy of note. However, the issue that we describe, discuss today is one on which Christina and I will, I am afraid, probably tend to disagree now and into the future. The necessity for welfare reform was something which was identified some time ago. In fact, the right time to reform welfare, I would suggest, is at the peak of the economic cycle rather than at the bottom or during a recovery phase as we currently are. And it was for that reason that it was perfectly right that Frank Field, a minister in the last Labour government in 2007, brought forward his initial proposals for welfare reform. I would suggest that if the Labour Party had had the courage of its convictions and had taken that programme forward back then, that we would perhaps be in a better position today than we are. Nevertheless, we are where we are and we have to deal with it. There are a couple of points I think it's fair to raise during the course of this debate. The first is the issue of disability benefits. 
There are criticisms that are being made over the transfer from DLA to PIP and that 20% cut in the expenditure that is expe expected within that budget heading is regularly uh, brought up. But we must remember that the change in entitlement to PIP will re result in a 20% reduction in those who are entitled to claim, but these people will not lose their benefits. They will be entitled to the same benefits as those who are looking for work at the moment, and they will receive the same assistance to find work, and they should be the 20% who are most able to make that transition. It is an appropriate thing, I believe, for government to attempt to help these people back into the work force in the way that they will. But the other issue that I think it's important that we raise here, and it's already been raised by Neil Finlay and others, is that of the activity this week, particularly in the House of Lords, relating to working tax credits. The policy uh, of reducing working tax credits and replacing them with higher wages in the workplace and other measures for support, including uh, childcare support, for example, is, I believe, a sound policy and one which we should all aspire to make work. The problem is, and it's been pointed out by many within the Conservative Party, most notably Ruth Davidson herself, who has taken the opportunity to raise the matter with the Chancellor, that if you're going to make that transition, you have to make sure people have the extra money in their pockets before you take the support away. The proposals appeared to indicate that the support was going to be taken away first and then, ultimately, the higher wages and the better support measures for childcare and other aspects would kick in. That is, not, that is simply unacceptable as a, a process, and it is necessary for us to get that in the right order. Yes, I give way. Neil Finlay. Thank Mr Johnson for taking the intervention. <coughs> Does he therefore uh, agree that the action of the House of Lords the other evening was absolutely right? Alec Johnson. I do agree that it was the, the mechanism that was available to us to take forward this matter in a way that was better for us all. However, I would point out that it is interesting that the decision by members of the Conservative Party, including Ruth Davidson, uh, to take action to further that objective, and the, the measures that were taken by members of the Labour Party to put forward the changes in the way they did, were ultimately extremely effective in obtaining the outcome that we wanted in the short term. I would suggest that the actions of the SNP have been an example of how the Scottish National Party's position can be disadvantageous and ineffective, and that the alternative routes have proved to be rather more effective in this instance. I hope that we can come to a conclusion, uh, and I am drawing my remarks to a conclusion at this time. It is vital that, as we go forward, we understand that the reform of welfare is necessary, that it is our duty to ensure that we reduce dependency on the state wherever we can, and that we deliver real independence for all those who are able to take it up. The issue of welfare reform will remain a central debate in this and other parliaments, but it's one that we cannot afford not to address. We need to make welfare deliver. We need to make welfare less significant as time goes on, because we need to get people back into the workforce, back into the workplace and back into a position that they have more control over their own lives. And that is what I aspire to under the welfare reform heading. Thank you. I now call George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Can I also take this time to thank Christina McKelvey for bringing this debate to the Chamber, because I know it's an important issue to her. And I know it's an important issue to most of us in our constituency work, uh, back in our constituencies, because as most of you know, and be aware, I'm convener of the cross-party group on multiple sclerosis. And recently, the MS Society Scotland brought this report out, President Officer, MS Enough, make sense of welfare, because more and more people with MS have been struggling to either act 
access benefits or uh, to retain what benefits they had. And one of the issues with MS in particular is that most people are diagnosed between their 20 and 30s, so it means that it's during the peak of their working life. So they go from being a professional person, being able to do everything that they want, uh, working, paying their bills, to someone who is actually having to rely on uh, the state now only because of their medical condition. And one of the problems one of the problems presiding officer with the legislation is it doesn't take long-term disability or long-term conditions into account. It is as if it's just a spreadsheet and to get that person off of that spreadsheet because they need to do something else. And that's the problem that we are seeing. That's the picture that's been painted in our constituencies. And I don't think that's good enough. I don't think it's good enough for us to be uh, going down that route. The MS Society in their report have said that 11,000 people in Scotland have MS and it's a life uh, lifelong condition and there is no cure. And they're, when they're asking to make welfare make sense, they're uh, saying that MS must be at the heart of shaping the system. And I would say that would be about any long-term condition, that when you're dealing with a welfare, because the whole idea of welfare is to support people in their time of need. And if we're going to be doing that as a society, then people that are uh, disabled or have long-term conditions are the very people that we are wanting to help. And uh, I think the system is wrong at the moment, and that's why I'm supporting Christina McKelvey. But when they did the report, they found out that 65% of people with MS agreed that without this disability benefits, they were unable to afford essential items such as food and heating. Food and heating, presiding officer. 85% agreed that without disability benefits, their independence would be negatively impacted, and 91% found the process of claiming disability benefits stressful, which the irony of that is, with a condition like multiple sclerosis, is that the actual pressure of going through the system could trigger another attack and make you actually probably qualify for the PIP one day as opposed to not qualify for it. Uh, and the way the system actually uh, decides whether a person is using PIP as an example, can the person sp uh, walk 20 yards of MS, 20 metres? Yes, they probably could. Uh, but they'll probably be in their bed for the next 24 hours because of the chronic fatigue that will follow on after that. So these very practical things must be taken into consideration because this is about people and the people that we serve. So one of the things that, uh, presiding officer, that you know, MS is, is enough. It's difficult enough to live with it without having to deal with Westminster's so-called reforms. Morma Simpkins, the director of MS Society in Scotland, said it's simply not good enough that people in Scotland who have MS have been forced to make difficult choices between heating their homes and attending hospital appointments. That's the situation that the Tories have now got many people dealing with long-term conditions in now. And that's not what this should be about. Presiding officer, it's not good enough for Alec Johnson to say we are where we are. That's not good enough. We're dealing with people's lives and the quality of that life is the important aspect as well. And because of that, I follow Christina McKelvey's call to have Westminster halt these so-called reforms now. Many thanks. Can I now invite Margaret Burgess to respond to the debate? Minister, seven minutes or so, please. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Christina McKelvey for bringing this issue to the Chamber, which all uh, who have spoken in the debate have agreed is an important issue and one that sh we should keep revisiting. Today's debate has given members an opportunity to reflect on the consequences of the continuing austerity programme being forced on the whole of the UK by the UK Government. And it will see £12 billion removed from welfare expenditure each year by 2019-20, with around a billion cuts being made in Scotland. And these draconian cuts undertaken by the UK Government are why the Scottish Government continues to do what it can with the limited resources we have to mitigate the impact of welfare reform and help those affected. And it's very clear that we in Scotland have a very different ideological position to the UK Government on the importance of social security. And like Neil fin Finlay, I, I think we should talk about it as social security. We see it as an inclusive safety net that at some point in our lives almost all of us will use. And I find it difficult to imagine any government of any persuasion in this parliament taking forward some of the UK measures in terms of social security. We know that individuals and families across Scotland are bearing the brunt 
of these reforms. The Scottish Government analysis shows the impact is being felt by the most vulnerable people in our society. And I think Christina McKelvey and George Adam have just highlighted some of the, the groups of people that are being uh, badly affected by these reforms. Sanctions hit young people hardest. The group most likely to be affected by the benefit cap is low and parents. Disabled people, as we've heard, are particularly affected uh, by the bedroom tax and many less lose facing some or all of their disability benefits due to reassessment from disability living allowance to PIP. Uh, and I, I heard what Alec Johnson said uh, about that, that 20 per cent that will lose their benefit can get into work. And, and I would suggest he applies the same theory to that as he was making for working tax benefits. Let's see if people can get into work. Let's support them into work before we actually take away their lifeline of benefit. And I think it applies across the board. I'll take Alec an Johnson. intervention. Trying, the point I was trying to make at the time uh, in my speech to which he refers is that those who uh, are no longer entitled to disability benefits will, of course, continue to be entitled to other out-of-work benefits, so they will not lose their support entirely. Minister? No, I think uh, that, that's semantic there. They might not lose their support entirely, but they will lose a considerable part of their income, which they require to make ends meet at the moment. And they're going to lose that if they lose their PIP, uh, which is additional to any other benefits they may get. So I really don't accept uh, Alec Johnson's point on that. And I think it's very clear uh, that it was made very by David Torrance. We're talking here about people, people that come to our surgeries, people that live in our communities, and we know that many of these people are turning to advice agencies eh, for help in their time of need. And the Scottish Government is doing what it can to help those affected. affected. And this includes investing £23 million across three years to 2016 to provide advice and support services to mitigate the impact of welfare reforms. And the Smith Commission does give Scotland opportunities on social security although only around 14% of social security spending will be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Powers over disability benefits and carers allowance will provide opportunities to have a more joined up system. And we've already started to indicate how we plan to use those powers to better support people in Scotland. And I think the First Minister has already announced if this government continues, then we would increase carers allowance in line uh, with job seekers allowance. And Neil Finlay talked about universal credit and some of the changes uh, to universal credit. And the flexibilities that the Smith Commission will give us in universal credit is, uh, will give us some, uh, the frequency of payment to the claimant to, and payment to the housing costs element direct to social landlords. We'll be able to, to do that with the flexibilities. Uh, and I would certainly agree with Neil Finlay that tenants are telling us that's how they would like their payments made direct to the landlord. But however, as the Scotland Bill, as it stands, fails to deliver a coherent set of powers that will allow us to tackle long-standing entrenched issues. But rest assured, we will continue. I'll take an intervention. Neil Finlay. I earlier that 14 per cent of benefits would be devolved. Um, almost 50 per cent of benefits is the state pension. Um, I don't think the minister is asking for that to be devolved. I wonder, could she clarify? Minister. Um, as Neil Finlay will be very clear, um, in the white paper that we produced when we were looking at an independent Scotland, we very much uh, asked for all social security powers to be devolved to Scotland, and, and obviously they would be, including the state pension. However, what we've been very clear about is that unless we get all the other levers of the economy and the power to raise all our own finance, then in those circumstances uh, we would not be asking for the, the state pension to be devolved. Um, so we will do what's best for Scotland and then best of the, the environment that we have for Scotland. So we are making progress in some key areas, but we also need to ensure that the wider fiscal framework is in place and will not accept a deal that is not fair for Scotland. And the Smith Commission was also clear about how it expected employment support to be devolved. It said that all employment programmes currently contracted by DWP for the unemployed should be devolved. And this would include, but not limited to, contracts to deliver the work pension and work choice. Smith also called for a new governance mechanism, mechanism to be established, which integrated the reserve functions of Job Centre Plus in Scotland. And as in the proposals for welfare devolution, 
We are concerned that the Scotland Bill does not deliver Smith's pro proposals on employment support. But the limitations of the Scotland Bill will not deter this Government, and we remain engaged in a discussion about how to create a fairer Scotland. Conversations, meetings and events are being taken place across the country about the type of country that we want Scotland to be. And it is not a traditional consultation. The process is designed to encourage and add to the conversation that is already going on throughout Scotland about how we create that fairer, better place to live and work. And we are determined, and I believe it is vital, that instead of doing things to communities, Scottish Government will do things in partnership with communities. A stock take paper has already been published, which provides an update of what we have learned throughout the process so far. And we plan to bring forward a social security bill in the first year of the new parliament. <laughs> Presiding officer, the true costs of the UK government's austerity programme are being especially felt by those least able to carry the burden. So it's entirely right that we demand that the UK government abandon these plans. And to conclude, presiding officer, the Scottish Government welcomes the motion from Christina McKelvey, which gives me the opportunity to reiterate our opposition to the UK Government's continued austerity. Thank you. Many thanks. That concludes Christina McKelvey's Holt Welfare Reform Members' Debate, and I now suspend this Parliament until 2 o'clock.